We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Just a little note on that uh, class, John, I was mentioning. I, I heard, I've known Neil for um, over 30 years, and I heard him speak on this topic several months ago. And I was really helped and encouraged. He speaks really well about how to be intentional and really love and help the people that God has put in your life. So we've been working on that a lot as a church this year. So when I heard him speak, I thought, we really have to have him come and, and talk to the group. And so uh, I challenge you to, to carve out the hour and a half. We're going to serve lunch, but I encourage you to carve out the time next Sunday from noon to 1.30 uh, to be a part of that. Well, this summer, we are working our way <clears throat> through the New Testament book of 1 John. And in this book, we are challenged to take the truths that we as Christians agree with. We nod our heads in agreement to, and we're challenged to take those truths and turn them into reality in our lives. So the title for this series this summer is From True to Real. Moving faith from our heads to our hearts. Now, our heads, of course, is, is where we think. It's where we analyze information. It's where we come to the conclusions about what is true and what is not true. We nod our head yes or no based on what we think and the analysis we do on a situation. But it's our heart where we decide which of those truths really, really matter when it comes to daily life. And so it's out of what's in our heart, what we think is real, what really matters most, not only is true, but also is real. It's out of the things that are in our heart that we end up saying the words we say and making the decisions that we make. If you were hiking in the, these mountains that are illustrated on the screens behind me, if you were hiking in these mountains, it would look more like this side of the wall than this side of the wall. Now, this side is true. All of the, the terrain and the elevations that are described in black and white is, is accurate. It's an accurate representation of this particular place. It's true. It represents the terrain. But if you were hiking in this place, it would not look like this to you. This is an illustration of what happens when we read the Bible. When we read the Bible, it, it looks like this. It's black and white. It's words on a page or on a screen. And in the Bible, we encounter a very detailed map of the terrain of life that we have to navigate, where the rocks are, where the cliffs are, where the rushing rivers are, how we get around things. The Bible is a very detailed map for life. But it's black and white. It's true. But it's when you take some part of the Bible and you use it to make a decision, you use it to navigate for yourself, that's when it moves from not only just being true, it also becomes real. And for you, that part of the Bible then begins to open up and it's, it's like it's full color. It's not that the truth has changed. It's not that the words have shifted. It's that now you see, oh, this is real. This really works. This really is how life is. It's not just true. It's also real. So the question is, how does truth move from our head to our heart and become real? Well, advancing an idea from true to real is not a mental exercise. We don't just decide, okay, I'm tired of thinking of this just as true. I'm also going to think of it as real. It's not a decision that we can make. We don't just decide what is real. We have to experience something in order for it to become real. What is true becomes real when we experience it. Now, I got my driver's license on my 16th birthday, which was an indication of how eager I was to drive and gain the freedom that is represented in driving. I just couldn't wait to drive. And I had taken the driver's ed class that was offered in the high schools back when I was there that was required in order to get your license on your 16th birthday. And I still remember a lot of the teachings that was done. I, I particularly remember uh, what we learned about defensive driving. I still remember, actually, the slides. I've got an image in my mind of the slide that shows the cars and how far apart they should be in order to be a defensive driver and be able to stop in time if the car in front of you stops suddenly. So defensive driving for me was true. But I just got my license. I was 16. It was not real. 
true, but not real. So how did it become real for me? Well, before my 17th birthday, I got in three, three accidents. I am single-handedly responsible in part for the reason why young men pay so much insurance, you know, why it's so costly for a 16-year-old young man to drive a car. But I will be honest, those three accidents are ingrained in my experience. And I am still, to this day, a defensive driver. If I'm driving with you, and you're driving, and I'm in the passenger seat, and you notice me grabbing onto stuff, it's because... Defensive stuff is real to me. I was in three car accidents in that first year. So this is what we're doing with the pages of 1 John. We're talking about the key truths that need to be real for us. So let's do a quick recap on what the book of 1 John says that we've covered so far, but what is not only true, but also needs to be real. We began, 1 John begins, making the case that Jesus Christ himself is real. Not just when he walked on the earth real, but now. And that's because Jesus is not just a real person of history. He is. You'll find almost no one that thinks he didn't exist. He is a real person of history, but he's not only that, he's also the real God. He is God in flesh. And what that means is he's not just a person of history to learn from. He's not just someone who wrote some amazing truths that we can consider. He is available to forgive your sins today. And he is available to walk with you and me today through the challenges of life. He is available to help us today. So he is real. And then we talked about, the next week, we talked about the fact that sin is real. And the reason sin is real is because there's consequences. If we defy what God says is right, we are deciding to add real pain and real suffering to our life. Because sin is not just, here's a list of things you might want to consider it's a description. Here's a cliff you might not want to step off. Here's a bridge you might not want to jump off. The challenge is that the consequences of sin are often not immediate. They are always eventual, occasionally immediate, but usually eventual consequences. And so when it comes to deciding to do the opposite of what God says, the consequences aren't felt immediately. So in a way, sin has, is more like farming real than gravity real. You know, gravity real is instant. You trip on your way out here to your car and you fall down to the ground. When will you feel pain? Then. Immediately, you will feel pain. You won't feel pain next week, next month. Well, it might linger that long. But the instant moment of pain is going to occur right then. But if you decide to defy God, when will you experience that pain? Maybe immediately, but almost always not immediately. It's more like farming real. Scripture says we reap what we sow. That's a farming image. You know, when a farmer sows the wrong seed, if a farmer wants corn and they sow peas, when, do, when does that reality become felt? Not immediately. Weeks if he recognizes the sprouts that are wrong, but months if he waits till the harvest and he realizes, I didn't want peas. Well, you planted peas. It's that kind of real. It's real, it's just a delayed real. And that's why we struggle to treat sin as something that's real. Because the consequences aren't gravity immediate. And then we looked at the idea that Christians are real. And what we mean by that, what the book of 1 John meant by that is that as Christians, we are not a group of people who have just drunk the Kool-Aid and decided to fall for some man-made set of ideas. That's what a lot of people think about us. But we understand that the words of God contained in the Bible are real. So we take God and his words seriously. And what happens over time is we are changed. We're never perfect. But we are changed and our life, although still hard because we live in a broken world, our life actually improves and there's more joy and there's more meaning because this is real now today we turn our attention to the next piece of real in the book of first john and that is the fact that heaven is real heaven is not just wishful thinking it's a real place 
so real that it has the power to affect the decisions that you and I make today. What we're going to read through is the three verses in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 that talk about this. So let's read through these three verses. Here's what it says. See what great love the Father, God, has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies themselves just as He is pure. So let's walk through this to try to unpack it and understand it. It starts with an amazing truth. If you have decided to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you have decided to follow Him as your Lord, the authority in your life, then you are a child of God. You are a member of the very family of God. Now, the way this happens is we decide that Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Those are the two descriptors, two titles given to him in the New Testament. The reason Savior is important is because none of us are good enough. If you think you're good enough, then you don't need a Savior. But for us who have decided that we need a Savior, we realize, well, we may be better than somebody else, and we're worse than a bunch of other people, and, but none of us are good enough. We need the forgiveness that only Jesus can offer, and so we ask him to save us, to forgive us. And then not only that, we're not smart enough. We're smart, but we're not smart enough to navigate the complexities of marriage and parenting and this world and our own sinful hearts. And so we ask Jesus to be our guide, to be our Lord. And when we do that, he says, you are a son or a daughter of mine. Now, we've done nothing to qualify for this. We didn't elevate our moral game, and he suddenly said, okay, you've done good enough now. Now you're a child of mine. No, we, we cried out for help and asked him to be our Savior and Lord, and he granted us that. The truth is, it's because God has lavished his love on us. He didn't just say, oh, okay, all right, I'll forgive you. No, the idea is lavished is he, he poured out his love on us that we might be forgiven and we might be helped in this life. Then it goes on to say, and that is what we are. Why repeat the truth? Well, this is First John's way of saying, did you get this? This isn't just true. This is real, everybody. Don't just glaze over this. Ponder this. We really are children of God because he has, God has lavished his love on us. Then it goes on to say, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. What's that talking about? It's talking about this fact isn't something that you're going to wake up and walk out into your day and people are going to say, oh, a child of God is walking by. No, you just look normal. Jesus himself looked like an average man. He didn't glow in the dark and neither do we. He didn't look any different than normal and neither do we. So the reason the world doesn't see this is they didn't see it about Jesus, and it, they, they can't see it in us and say, are, are you a member of the eternal royal family of God? That can't be seen. That's a real true, but it, it, the truth, but it can't be seen. And what that means is we struggle at times, and we have a hard time really seeing ourselves as a child of God. And seeing that as real. Again, if we were treated like royalty every day, we might begin to think that we really are sons and daughters of the king, but we are not treated like royalty every day. And it goes on to say, dear friends, now we are children of God. This is the third time. This is, you know, this is real, really real. We are children of God. And what that means is what we will be has not yet been made known. What it's saying is there will be a day when being a child of God will be visible. Anyone who looks at us on that day will see that we are princes and princesses of God. But this is not that day. So how can this great truth become real to us and change our daily outlook, the daily outlook of our lives? It's through this powerful word called hope. 
That's what the last verse talks about in this passage today. 1 John 3, verse 3. It's this hope that changes us. Hope in what? Hope in heaven. Now, hope sounds like the least real thing that there is. It's not even true yet because it hasn't happened yet. So how can it be real? We don't even know what we're going to look like in heaven, it says. All we know is that we're going to look enough like Jesus so we're going to recognize him. But it turns out that hope is more real than we often think it is. It says in verse 3, again, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This is an amazing statement. What it's saying is that Hope has the power to alter behavior, to purify life, to change someone. That's as real as it gets. You see, hope is what gets us out of bed in the morning and moves us toward a goal. Everything we do is because we've anchored our hope in something in the future, something we want to accomplish that isn't visible, but it's real in our hearts. And we move that direction because we want what we hope for. Hope really is the compass of the heart. Not the mind, the heart. It's the compass of the heart that helps us navigate to places that we can't see because it's in the future. Now, for us as Christians, the hope of heaven is magnetic north. That's where we're headed. It is real to us. It is so real that it alters and purifies our behavior today. How is that possible? Well, the challenge we have is that for most people, we're pretty fuzzy about that hope. We're pretty fuzzy about heaven. Even Christians are fuzzy about heaven. And a fuzzy hope is not a real hope. It doesn't change us. Last year, I read a study by the Pew Research Group that reported that 73% of all Americans believe in heaven. Now, 73% of all Americans don't agree on anything. But on this one thing, 73% of Americans believe in heaven. So, for most, heaven is true. But if you listen to people talk about heaven, it doesn't take long before you figure out, so, but it's not real for you, right? Just listen to what you say about heaven. You're not talking about something real. Several years ago, Stan Lee died at the age of 95. You don't know who he is. He is the one who created many of the superheroes in the Marvel comic universe. So it was interesting back then to, to see, and you can do this with any celebrity. Whenever a celebrity dies, just go to Twitter and listen to what people say about heaven. It's bizarre. Here's what they said about Stan Lee. Al Roker, the the weatherman, said this. He is just waiting for us in Asgard. Really? Is is he? He's in Asgard? I mean, it's a reference to the comic book Homeworld um, in the Thor movies. Now, of course, I, I just can't believe someone as smart as Al really thinks he's in Asgard or thinks Asgard is real. But Al Roker is reflecting what most people think about heaven. It's It's as real as Asgard. It's comic book real, which means not real. George Takai, Star Trek fame, says this, said this, rest with the stars, great sir. And that sounds comforting, doesn't it? Until you think about it, it's like, how would you do that? Space is really, really cold and mostly dark. And if you got too close to a star, it'd get really hot. So again, this is not a real idea. This is just what people say. Josh Groban, I don't know why Josh felt like he needed to say something, but (laughs) Twitter just makes people feel like they need to say something. So Josh said, maybe you have Twitter in heaven. Again, really? I mean, Elon Musk might buy it if there is Twitter in heaven, but... Did did he really think this? No, of course not. And it's not just celebrities that get wacky when they talk about heaven. Now, I know it's, well, whenever you go to a funeral, just listen to what people say about the deceased. Don't say anything to them because it's a time of grief, but people say some pretty interesting things about their loved ones. 
you know, you listen to eulogies, and it, I mean, I've heard everything, you know, from he's playing golf with Jesus right now. It's like, really? Is, do you, do you, you don't really think that, right? No, they don't. Or, or fishing. Or they're on a big shopping spree with no limit to their credit cards. It's like, so really, that's heaven? Really? Again, no, not really. Not real, really. No one is making any real-life decisions based on these kinds of statements about heaven. And here's the challenge. If our hope in heaven is going to purify, which means change us, improve our lives so that we sin less, then it's going to have to be a real hope, not an Asgard hope, not a golf in heaven hope, a real hope. Now, when it comes to the hopes that we have in this life, we don't have any problem with those because, you know, if, we, if you hope to travel to Fiji one day, you can see pictures of Fiji. You can probably talk to people who've been there. I have. I thought, I'd like to go there. I hear the food's really expensive, but that didn't stop me. It's amazing. But when it comes to heaven, you can't talk to someone that's been there. You can't look at a set of pictures and so it becomes less real for us. This is why God has given us a book in the Bible to imagine and form our imaginations about heaven and make the hope of heaven more real to us. It's the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. So we're going to take a detour from 1 John 3 to the last chapter, or second to last chapter in the book of Revelation. No, actually the last chapter. Now what's interesting is God used the same author to write the book of 1 John that he did to write the book of Revelation. John, the disciple of Jesus, wrote both. In the book of Revelation, we find words of poetry that describe heaven. Not every word in the book of Revelation is a word of poetry, but the majority are. Why? Well, poetry is the closest that words can get to full color. They're still black and white, but it's using words to paint images. And God wants our hope in heaven to be informed by the full-color words of a poet, not the black-and-white words of an engineer describing the exact dimensions of your accommodations so you can figure out your furnishings. That's not what God wants to set in our hearts. And the thing about poetry, and I'll just be honest, I, I'm not a big poetry reader. But what I've heard <laughs> is that poetry is anchored in the experiences that we know it's anchored in what we know now, but it transports us beyond what we know. It, it moves us to what we haven't experienced yet and points us in that direction. And that's what is done in the book of Revelation about the imagery of heaven. You see, heaven is not an entirely foreign place for which we have absolutely no reference points. As you read through the description of heaven in the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation, it turns out that heaven is the fulfillment of a lot of the things that we have longed for in this life. A lot of the deep motivations of our heart find their fulfillment in the description of heaven. C.S. Lewis has one of my favorite descriptions of heaven as he summarizes what the Bible says about heaven this way. He says, the door on which we've been knocking all our lives will open at last. We were knocking on this door and thought, this is what it opened. It's like, that's nah, not it. But heaven, that door swings open. This is the door I've been knocking on my whole life. In the last chapter of Revelation, we're given a painting of heaven. And I want us to consider this painting so that the hope that we have in heaven might be a little more real for us all. It starts out by describing heaven in an interesting way. The beginning of Revelation 21, verse 2, it says, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, the shocking thing, if you think about it, is heaven is presented as a city. Now, a city doesn't feel, fit the bill for our vision of what we think heaven should be like. I mean, from our perspective, the closest thing to heaven on earth is nature, wilderness, ocean, not city. I mean, if we want to rest and restore our spirits, we don't usually think, you know what? 
Let me ride the blue line down to downtown LA. That should recharge me. No. We think of getting out of town. We think of going to the beach. We think of nature, not city. But that's because we only know of the kinds of cities that this world offers. Cities where we must live if we're to find work. Cities full of traffic and crime and competition and noise and pollution. Places that we need to escape from if we're going to even get a whiff of the smell of heaven. But this city, the heavenly city, is not like any of the cities we've ever known. In this city, we learn that heaven really is God's version of an, ex- it's not rather God's version of an extended vacation or retirement. It's not just eternal rest. It's not, you know, forever at the Hyatt Spa. That's not the image of heaven. Heaven is not about escaping reality, but about completing it. Heaven is the place where we get to finish what we've tried to start in this life many times. We get to actually accomplish what we've always longed to accomplish. You see, this life is not one big throwaway. And then we go to heaven. To be sure, much of what we have done here will not make the trip. You know, we remodeled our bathroom. Our bathroom in heaven will, I don't know that we'll have bathrooms in heaven. It's not going to make the trip. And if we are to enter this holy city, all of our sins must be forgiven. Our sins, thankfully, will not make the trip. But that doesn't mean that everything that we've ever done here is pointless, and then we start all over again in heaven. Now, this earth and this life is where we start the things that are important, the things that matter, the things that God loves, or we don't start those things. This is where we get a chance to start. Heaven is where we get to continue and finish. And that requires a city, not a wilderness. A place of work, unlike the meaningful work that we try to find here. Now, a tour of this city of heaven reveals two themes that are behind everything that we've been in pursuit of here. If you look behind everything we've really pursued, what's really in our hearts, these are the two big things that we will find in heaven. Here's the two. First of all, we have been, in this life, looking for a place to belong. In heaven, we will find this is where we belong. We've been trying to find it here. You know, the major purpose of a city is to provide its inhabitants with a place to belong, with a place to live, and a place to work. You see, I don't just live in this city. I don't just work in this city. I belong here. This is my home. This is where I live. This is where you live. This is where I fit into the sea of humanity on this planet. And that's important because we were not created to wander aimlessly. We were created to land somewhere and build homes somewhere and build lives somewhere. And that's, for most people, what a city does. It's what it does for me and what it does for you. Now, I love traveling. But there's nothing like returning home to my bed and my couch and my job. The reason I love returning home is because now I know where everything belongs. I know where stuff is. I know what to do because this is where I belong. I can only take a certain number of days where I wake up and say, what are we doing today? That's great for two weeks. After that, I need some routine. I need to know where I belong. And that's what I love about my home. I know where things are. At least I did until March 23rd. On the 23rd of March, a pipe burst and flooded part of our house. We moved into a hotel for a number of weeks. We're back home now. But it's really not home yet. That's because it's under construction. So for almost four months now, (laughs) my wife and I together, I don't know, we probably have spent hours looking for clothes. It's either in the garage or in this room or that room. It's spread out. One day, I, I think I spent five minutes looking for this belt. 
I will get up in the middle of the night and pause to think, now, which bathroom is working again? <laughs> and it's just disorienting. It's, it's very stressful to try to make a stable home in an unstable environment. And that's just kind of a small picture of what we all experience in this world, even if your home is in great shape right now. It is very disorienting and stressful to try to make a stable home in an unstable world. And this is an unstable world. Just when we think we've got things where it should be, someone moves it. Circumstances change. And we're once again unstable and unsettled. Here's a description of the heavenly city. 21, verses 15 through 17. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod. I've seen a lot of measuring devices in my house of gold to measure, none of them have been gold, to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using a human instrument, and it was 144 cubits thick. Now, if you just do the math, and that's all you do, this is not going to impress you. If you Look at a rendering of this, if you try to imagine this in your mind. If you allow your imagination to form this city in your mind, you'll be struck by the symmetry of this city. Why is it so symmetrical? It's because in this city, nothing is out of place. Nothing sticks out. Nothing doesn't belong. Everything belongs. It's a perfect square. Everything is proportionate. Everything makes sense. All the parts have a purpose and they all have a place. This is what we have been trying to do with our lives. Not build a square city, but find a place for everything in our lives. We've been trying to find our place in this world. Now, maybe we've had a clear sense of purpose for a period of time, but my experience and most people's experience is that sin, personal sin or the sin of other people, have a way of smashing the belongingness that we have, the place that we found, and reducing us to day-to-day -day meaningless existence. It's easy to lose our way and our place in this world. And the cities of this world that have been tainted by sin resemble our lives. Our lives look like a combination of good neighborhoods that were carefully planned and bad neighborhoods that have been abandoned. That's what our lives look like. Our lives look like some of it, people and efforts that have been neglected and now wander like the homeless of our cities do, without a real place. But none of that happens in heaven. In heaven, every plan is good. Every project is finished. Every person belongs. This is the door on which we've been knocking our entire lives. The second image that we see in the painting of heaven is that the fact that we've been looking for a beauty to possess. Heaven is the culmination of all beauty. This week, many of you probably saw NASA release the first images taken from the James Webb Space Telescope. This is one of those images. You probably saw this. Stunning. I've been reading what the scientists have been saying about these images. And I'll be honest, they don't sound much like scientists this week. They sound like artists. They are, and by this is their own words, emotional, teary-eyed, at a loss for words. But you're scientists. But at the very core, they're people made in God's image who have a deep longing for beauty, and when they see it, the data goes out their mind. Say, they're lost for words. They're emotional. They're teary-eyed. You know, there's a lot of data in these images and the ones to come, but what, what captures us all is the beauty. You know, beauty is not just a passing interest for us as humans. It's a pursuit. It's, I will say, it's an obsession. This is why we become obsessed, sometimes with our own beauty or, more often, with the beauty of another. It's why we love music. It's why we stop to look at sunsets. It's why we travel great distances to see some of the amazing things in our world. We just can't get enough of beauty. 
But the beauty of this world is a poor reflection of the home that we were created for, heaven itself. Here's some of the descriptions of heaven. Verse 5 again, this is all in, in Revelation. There will be no more light. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. This is an important first step in beauty. Light. Light's the essential requirement to be able to see the beauty of what God has made. But the light of heaven is not just a flipping on of a switch so that we can see. Now, the city itself is constructed to be a reflection of light. It's always daylight. It's always beauty. And the reason is to display beauty. Here's the description. Revelation 21, 18 to 21. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. That's amazing. The great, city of the, uh, the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. This is a list of precious stones. What is it that makes a stone precious? Its ability to reflect color. That's what makes it precious. That's the definition of a precious stone. You see, light is really the gathering of all colors. That's what we see when we look through a prism. The light is separated into all of the colors. It is represented in light. What precious stones do is they capture one light wave, one, one color, and they reflect it. And that becomes precious to us. The light of heaven is not measured in lumens, but in color. The point is not just so that we can see where we are going, but so that we can be captured by its beauty. And I use that word captured intentionally. It's not enough for us just to find our place in this world that we talked about, to find a place to belong. We also want beauty, not just observing beauty. We want to be captivated by beauty. It's interesting, when you hear people speak of beauty, you hear that word captivated often. Usually the word captive is a negative word, but not when it comes to beauty. And that's because beauty invites us to enter and not leave. But in this world, we always have to leave beauty, don't we? The concert always ends. The sunset, the sun is always going to set. The sunset goes away. The snow always melts. The beauty of the human form ages. So beauty in this world invites us in, and then it turns us away. Say, concert's over. Sunset's set. Heaven is the only answer to this invitation that keeps its promise. The city... Full of light and color is not a painting to marvel at or a destination to visit. It's not a bucket list item. The invitation is to live in this place. Here's what we read in Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. Here we are, back to children of God. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. You see, we have spent our whole life as outsiders trying to get inside, trying to be in the right group, trying to be famous, trying to be recognized. We've been outsiders of belonging, outsiders of beauty, observing it occasionally, enjoying it from time to time, and then turned away. But in heaven, we will dwell forever in the presence of the author of beauty and the creator of all color. And we will belong. We will be at home with our God. So heaven is real. Not just after we die, but now. That's why John says in 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Every time, what this means is every time you obey what God says, every time you do what God says is the right thing, you feel a little less lost in this world because you're finding your place as a child of God. And every time you do the kind of thing that God loves, you get a taste of the joy 
that will be untainted by tears in the presence of God, the author of beauty. Another statement that C.S. Lewis made, I don't have it on the screen, but here's what he, he, the idea that he creates. He's talking about the temptation of sin, and he says, when we fall into temptation, it's not, the problem is not because our desires are too strong. The problem is because our desires are too weak. When we fall into sexual temptation, the problem is that we've decided to settle for sex. Or we've decided to settle for alcohol. Or we've decided to settle for a chemical. Or we've decided to settle for retirement or a vacation or a possession when only the presence of God will ever truly satisfy. Our desires are too weak. We need stronger desires that only heaven can satisfy. That will purify us. So let's lift our heads beyond this world and not just aim for the stars, but for heaven itself. Let's pray. Father, we... Maybe we've gotten a glimpse this morning, but we just have to say how great it is, how amazing it is that you have lavished your love on us, that we actually should be called and can be called your children. We don't deserve that. We could never qualify for that. And it's really easy for us to forget this because we don't look any different. There's no crown of prince and princess of heaven sitting on our heads. We just look like everyone else. But one day, one day we will and the world will see what is actually true and real. And I pray that this glimpse of heaven that you've given us might purify us today and this week as we set our hearts on the things that not only matter here, but will matter in heaven, as we build the foundation that we will be able to complete in your presence. We pray this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.